Welcome to the OPSEC of protesting. Don't worry about taking notes or screenshots. Of course, this talk is recorded, but references and links to everything I'm talking about can be found at tinysi slash OPSEC. So, who am I and what do I do? My name is Oshawn Marshall. I code, I teach, I hack. I am a full-time developer, full-time red teamer, cybersecurity consultant, pen tester, whatever you want to call me. But when I'm not doing either of those things, I'm teaching you how precisely to take over the world. Now, as part of the penetration testing, you're doing constant risk assessments from the perspective of the customer. Finding an exploit is fun and dandy, but if you don't explain why it's bad and how it harms operations, you won't get anywhere. And so I'm inviting you into that same mindset. Last year, I wrote this blog on the OPSEC of protesting. This was following the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Omri, Tony McDay protests. And a lot of fishy stuff was going on in terms of the surveillance state, as well as people trying to dox people. And so this blog was a collection of advice I was ha passing along to my activist friends. He, in that article, I focused on basic security hygiene, use multi-factor authentication everywhere, encryption at rest and in transit, all of the, the password managers, VPNs, all of these little uh, things that you can add to improve your security posture, um, different security controls. And that is great, and that's excellent, and that fits in line with my background and what I do. And not these uh, steps will actually improve your privacy. However, you need to focus in on the why. Because why is critical. Why determines what security controls you're willing to put into place. Why also determines which security controls are better than others. And why can help determine security controls that, if implemented, will harm your OPSEC in other ways. And so we're in a quiet moment now, politically. Um, but that doesn't mean that the government or some other institution isn't going to do something that you don't agree with. So protesting is also not just a right here in the United States. It is a responsibility. So societies that fail to update themselves become brittle, stagnated, tyrannical, and crumble. And I really love this year's DEF CON theme, like Can't Stop the Signal, because this is how you promote change. This is how you promote uh, where you can change the world, more specifically the society that you live in, in a way that actually makes things better for you and everyone around you. you know? And so you do, protesting is the PRs. That is how we update society's source code. And when we finally implement and do that, that gets transformed into the nitty gritty uh, legislation as well as judicial or reinterpretation of laws and executive policy. My goal in this talk is to arm you to the teeth because I don't care about your particular politics. You as a human being have every right to express your thought and your opinions without ruining yourself, you know? So let's dive into OPSEC. So I'm gonna this huge definition from NIST. What really you need to focus in on is OPSEC is short for operational security and you Really, the goal of this is control is protecting yourself from threats by controlling evidence of your plans, your thoughts, and your intentions from an adversary. And so it's not about hypothetical, it's not about best practice or whatever. It's actually working through what will work for your situation, for the goals that you're trying to achieve. And... For an activist, these sorts of strategies can be immediately practical. So say this with me. Aya, that is I quadruple A. 
that this is the five-step process for ops, uh, protesting. So these steps don't have to be taken in any particular order, but any pre-thought, meditation, and information that you can glean from previous steps will only serve you in by enhancing the analysis and thought process in subsequent steps. So the first step is the, the first step is the identification of critical information. The second step is the analysis of threats. Third is analysis of vulnerabilities. Fourth is assessment of risks now that you know what your threats are and what your vulnerabilities are. And then once you have all, all that knowledge together, then you apply the appropriate countermeasures. So what exactly is sensitive information? I can tell you one thing that isn't necessarily sensitive information in terms of uh, my ability to uh, in terms of my ability to be a cybersecurity consultant or developer um, is images of my naked body. So I shower at the local YMCA. So all you have to do to get read-only access to me is wake up at five in the morning and make a drive. Um, and also be also be identify as male. So knowing that information, although it would be embarrassing and uh, my wife would have some words to say to you, uh, knowing that information does not impact my ability to both write code and to present my, and to do risk assessments as a cybersecurity consultant. And note that the that what I said is that critical information isn't crit, that information isn't critical for me. Um, what is critical for you depends on what your goals are and what and what um, it, and what the adversary can do armed with that information. So if you're the Department of Defense, for example. Anything about DOD activities, intentions, capabilities, um, limitations, any of those things that can be used to get military, economic, or political advantage, or strategic advantage that an adversary can get, um, that is critical information. That automatically falls under the umbrella of critical information. So how do we bring this back down to the perspective of an activist or, a, or an activist organization? Usually, for an activist, the goal is to spread the message of the movement. And so the usually the things that are critical information include time of location of demonstrations. Now, again, you, you have to strike a balance. You want to gather in large numbers, that's the whole point. But disclosing that information a bit too early can allow, adver can allow the adversary to respond with an increased police presence. Also, if you are consciously breaking the law, uh, if you're a conscious objector, if you're consciously breaking the law, your personal and financial networks are also vital for an activist organization. Donor lists, um, people who support you, if they feel the, if they feel that um, they can be de-anonymized or they can come under fire you will find you will find that funding gets stripped and things like that um, another good one is a moral or criminal activity in leadership of the activist organization so for ask any politician uh, reputational harm or reputational damage is an easy way to stop spreading the message and, uh, and stop spreading the movement so knowing this information and knowing this information ahead of time you an organization can plan and their leadership and say okay this person doesn't need to necessarily be in the forefront because of past uh, past criminal history or whatever 
Now we move on to step two, and this is the analysis of threats. Now that you have an idea and intuition of what is critical information, what is sensitive, what you're trying to protect, now you need to view your threat landscape. Any meaningful change to society's source code means that there will be opposition. So threats are any potential occurrence that can create that undesired outcome. Hurricanes are threats, but in, here in OPSEC we really focus in on the people threats known as adversaries. So who are your adversaries when you're protesting? Well, there are two major ones. There are state actors, um, that those are governments as well as law enforcement, and also you have counter-movement protesters, so counter-protesters. If you're protesting non-violently, your goal is to persuade the mostly inactive majority to your cause. Some people put the mainstream media as an adversary, and that may not necessarily be the case. Uh, new, major news outlets actually are an asset to any activist. Um, they help spread the message and amplify uh, the word. The only time where you're in the direct opposition is when uh, you're, the message that you're saying may conflict with their revenue streams. And so the only reason why any of these media outlets may be particularly political one way or another is just to cater to certain demographics and continue on that revenue stream. So, if media only opposes you if you're A, boring, or if you get in the way of their money. So now that you know who the adversary is, and now you need to understand what is the adversary's intent and capability. From there, you can derive the adversary's goals. Some adversaries want complete subjugation of your group identity. Some want full-on genocide. Others, it's just maintaining the status quo. Usually the goals of the adversary in the more immediate term is to block the immediate goals of a particular protest. If you are an activist, maybe you're protesting to influence a local or national election. Or maybe you're applying pressure to certain institutions. Or Maybe it's just, again, to amplify and continue spreading that word. The list could go on. But anything that gets in the way of that is the adversary's goal. Anything that negates that, I should say. So, what are the tactics that yeah, your adversary will use? Infiltrators are a good one. And a historical example... I would like an historical example I'd like to bring up is Thurgood Marshall, and he was a senior member of NAACP, a continue act leader in that space. He leaked information to the FBI in order to weed out communists. Nowadays, when you have a large protest, you'll see that you have. A uh, large group of people and then all of a sudden a brick flies through the window and it dishevels from there. Uh, violence is another form of disruption. Uh, just because you may be protesting peacefully doesn't mean, necessarily mean that counter-movement protesters aren't going to explicitly target you and edge you on. This is especially can be, this actually can be part of the adversary's overall strategy because certain news outlets will spread narratives in the story in different ways. So if you can egg on someone else, get them to get them to respond in a violent way, that can get spun up, that can get spun in different ways as well. And also general surveillance is a is another tactic and strategy. So, with those strategies in mind, you need to ask yourself, what does the adversary already know about the mission? What critical information has already been exposed by the adversary? 
So if you attended this talk a bit late and the time and location of a protest has already been leaked, well, that information is already available to the adversary. So now there can be an enhanced police presence. And I say things that it can be more or less severe depending on the particular threat that you're going into. For example, if you're a Hong Kong protester, time and location of large gatherings could be the difference between uh, life and death in some cases, or indefinite whole indefinite jail time. So now that you know your threatened landscape, now that you have a, an intuition of who your threats are, their strategies, now you can go into the analysis. Of vulnerabilities. This is not, instead of looking outward at what the world looks like, you now have to look inward. So a vulnerability is the absence or weakness in an asset, safeguard, or countermeasure. Being able to communicate digitally is an asset, but the flaws, limitations, or errors within your technology stack are vulnerabilities. And so your adversary will const is all you have to assume that your adversary is constantly on the lookout looking for critical information and things to glean. And so you need to take inventory of what you use to communicate. And let's take the hacktivist attacks on Gab and Parler, for example. And I'm not going to call Parler a hack because uh, Scraping a publicly available website uh, of information that's out on the open internet anyway is not a hack. But those are the sort, if there's no, if your platform that you're using doesn't use any rate limiting, um, the speed in which your adversary can gain that critical information then uh, accelerates. Now, Gab in the, uh, is actually a hacktivist attack because the SQL, it was essentially a SQL injection flaw. The one major reason why that SQL injection flaw was found was because Gab is an open source social media platform. The source code for the platform is public is publicly available and has to be in order to maintain the licensing so when you are planning communications for an activist organization you need to examine okay the pros and cons of each pot uh, each communication tool that uh, you use because as the Navy says loose lips sink ships and that's true within uh, protesting and activism as well. So my advice here is if you're planning sensitive meetings about the inner workings of your group, uh, potential strategy, discussing um, major overall strategies, try not to have those sorts of things on the open internet. Uh, you can use social media to get the word out, but there are some things that have to stay internal before it can be presented to the general audience and general pu public. Um, do you also keep in mind that there are some things that you some things that can leak critical information later on. So let's say let's say time and since say um, knowing that this member A it corresponds directly to leadership in an activist organization, that in and of itself may not be critical information. But member A also attend also has this style of laptop, also connects to the Wi-Fi at that grandmother's house with a weak Wi-Fi password. That's how that you could see that that's that through the chaining of all that information together is how critical information can then continue to be leaked. So one of the best ways to identify what could be pieced together and 
as critical information of all is hack yourself. Like not just go through threat modeling and as an intellectual exercise, but actually find people in industry who are willing to just do not just the risk assessment, but see, all right, we use these sorts of communication tools. These people are, are your targets. Can you get it? Can you get any information from them? And that's a really good way to find out real vulnerabilities. So now that you know your threat landscape and as well as the vulnerabilities within your particular organization, now you have the tools with which to actually define your risks. Because risks are any level of risk depends on the level of threat of your threats multiplied by the number or the intensity of your vulnerabilities. And so you could have a single threat actor exploiting all, multiple vulnerabilities or multiple, thre uh, uh, multiple threat actors exploiting just one critical flaw. So there is n in nonviolent protesting, there is no such thing as eliminating threats. Uh, what you do instead is just denying information to your threats and you reduce your vulnerabilities by selecting your communication mechanisms, limiting information, um, limiting information through members, so authorization checks for certain things, and also thinking through, okay, if these members are also leaked, what's the risk if the information known by this group is leaked or is leaked out. Now we're at the fun part and that is the applying the appropriate countermeasures. So now that we can do a risk probability whether it's high, medium, or low, then you can start addressing your various risks. Now again none of this is ironclad in terms of order. You don't have to you don't have to start at one, two, three, but any information that you glean from the first works in the last. So what makes a good, now that we're in this step, we can work out what makes a good countermeasure. And any countermeasure that does not reduce risk in a meaningful way is not an effective countermeasure. It's just a waste of time, right? Second, is that the countermeasure in and of itself cannot lead to OPSEC indicators, little pieces and nuggets of information that can be pieced together and disclose critical information. Again, that reduces the effectiveness of what a countermeasure is supposed to do. And third, and this is something that you really involves some meditation and some planning is the cost of the countermeasure cannot exceed the benefit of what uh, cannot exceed the um, cost uh, cost of if that risk was exploited in the first place so the countermeasure if the countermeasure or de, if the countermeasure is way too expensive to actually implement and I'm not talking about expensive in terms of money I'm talking about expensive in terms of effort in coordinating and collaborating then the benefits are mute because no one's going to use it now that we know that we know these three things we can cycle back to the how now things like burner phones you can actually do an assessment on that. Burner phones work. However, if you use you purchase the burner phone with a debit or credit card, that's not really going to help that's not really going to help you. If you use the burner phone in proximity to your real cell phone, that is that's not going to help you. In fact, they're in fact creepy doll 
talk. There's another DEF CON talk that was done a while ago. You can show that correlation between two devices being activated. And so every security control that you wish to implement has to be examined within the context. Other security controls pass this smell test. So let's use Signal, for example, like using Signal for, uh, for, for encrypted communication. That works, and that doesn't seem to be difficult to implement. And so there are other tools like password managers, VPNs, multi-factor authentication, and setting up encryption at rest. All of these things are, are effective and will pass the smell test. So keep calm and calculate on. So in the beginning, I promised you to give you the how and explore the why. And the how of OPSEC is simple. It is the five steps, the identification of critical information, the analysis of threats, in the analysis of your own vulnerabilities, a risk assessment not armed with the previous two pieces of information, as well as the application of appropriate countermeasures. That's the how, and that just leaves us with the why. And I can't give you your why, but I can present mine. I am here right now speaking to you because someone made a pull request. It took planning, it took ingenuity, and of course, some caution. And I want to empower you to keep the signal going and present your changes into the world. Thank you.